developmentally supportive care in the NICU. This baby right here is a guy on the go. In the NICU incubator, he's seen high and low. I'd like to define this patient of mine, and here's what I want you to know. He's small, weak, and early, and that's just how it goes, from the top of his head to the tips of his toes. It's always this way, and it's plain as the day. He's small, weak, and early, and it shows. You've not been well for a while, and I know it has been such a trial, but to my great delight, you are winning the fight. I'll soon see your wonderful smile. Your parents' hearts may be heavy, it's true. There is, in fact, much I can do. So know that I'll try to help you get by and make things less painful for you. Although NICUs are instrumental in the survival of high-risk and premature infants, these facilities often have detrimental repercussions. The NICU environment influences the infant's physiological functioning, motor activity, and state organization. Overall, the NICU is not conducive in the development of infants. Developmentally supportive care can be defined as care of an infant to support positive growth and development while allowing stabilization of physiologic and behavioral functioning. So, what is developmentally supportive care? Well, the goal of developmentally supportive care is to provide a structured care environment which supports, encourages, and guides the developmental organization of the premature or critically ill infant. It recognizes the physical, psychological, and emotional vulnerabilities of premature infants and their families and is focused on minimizing potential short and long-term complications associated with the hospital experience. Developmentally supportive care is newborn care that minimizes the impact of the NICU environment and invasive care practices and encourages parental participation, which promotes more appropriate brain development. Providing developmentally supportive care is crucial in decreasing stresses for infants and families and has been shown to decrease incidences of unstable vital signs, hypoxia, neonatal complications, and results in a shorter hospital stay. The standards of providing developmentally supportive care include 1. Protected sleep, so this is all non-emergent caregiving uh, should be performed during wakeful states. 2. Pain and stress assessment and management, so assess for pain with each handle and manage it appropriately. 3. Activities of daily living, so therapeutic positioning, feeding, skin care, non-nutritive sucking, infant feeding cues, flexion, containment, and alignment. Four is family-centered care, so having the family involved as much as possible, which promotes stronger bonding and attachment and healing for the infant, as well as allowing them unrestricted access. And five is a healing environment, so structuring the environment for the best development possible for the infant. So being mindful of lighting and noise, ensuring privacy and single rooms if possible. So these are just a few examples of what developmentally supportive care looks like. Furthermore, the NICU environment can influence developmentally supportive care by doing things such as decreasing alarm loudness, speaking in low tone voices away from babies and not over incubators, encouraging visitors to speak quietly, responding quickly to alarms, no cell phones, moving equipment quietly, preparing things away from the bedside if possible, gently opening doors, drawers, and incubators. Also, parents should be involved as much as possible by checking temperature, changing diapers, washing and cleaning the baby's face and body, doing skin to skin if baby tolerates it, hand hugs and containing the infant, and of course, advocating for their baby. So here we have an example of developmentally supportive care in which we're correcting a nest for baby. So nesting is one way that we're trying to mimic the womb environment in our NICU. It makes baby feel safe, contained, and like his new environment is similar to his old one, which was in his mom's uterus. When baby was inside the womb, it was dark. So in order to mimic this and provide developmentally supportive care, we can use incubator covers to decrease the amount of light that is reaching baby. 
Being inside the womb also provided a sound barrier for baby. And oddly enough, being inside an incubator increases the sound. So we should be very mindful of this and speak quietly and try not to talk over incubators. Non-nutritive sucking during painful procedures or when baby is fussy is another way we can provide developmentally supportive care for baby, especially when mom or dad aren't around to comfort baby. Respiratory support can interfere with the ability of the infant to communicate his needs. Detrimental effects of respiratory support on developmentally supportive care include lighting, so we need bright lights to assess respiratory status and often are still on during invasive procedures. Noise, so CPAPs or ventilators have constant loud noises that are intensified from inside the incubator. Positioning, so developmentally supportive care positioning is impaired and limited by the equipment on baby's face and head sometimes. Skin to skin, so sometimes it may not be possible because baby may risk accidental extubation. Movement, so baby's movements may be limited due to limited range of motion and posture and positioning from the equipment. And hands are kept away from baby's face to protect the baby from pulling out the CPAP mask or the ventilator tube. And prolonged restrictive body position can result in skeletal deformation, muscle shortening, and restricted joint mobility. Also, endotracheal intubation can inadvertently result in an extended neck posture, which may weaken anterior neck muscle and result in retracted shoulders. So it happens to uh, impact later issues with keeping the head midline and bringing hands midline. Skin to skin is one of the biggest factors in developmentally supportive care. There are so many amazing benefits to baby and encouraging kangaroo care is a must. Containment is another developmentally supportive care component. So many parents are unaware that their baby likes to be contained the way that they do. But it mimics the womb, so it is important to let them know that instead of giving them a pat on the back or rubbing them to try and comfort them, like most would assume, containing them truly increases their comfortability and decreases their unorganized state. So, how can developmentally supportive care benefit infants who are on respiratory support? Well, developmentally supportive care is important to every infant in the NICU, but infants with respiratory support are even more vulnerable and benefit tremendously from developmentally supportive care. Developmentally supportive care is reported to increase physiological stability, decrease days of respiratory support, lessen the use of exogenous surfactant, decrease incidence of apnea, lessen the use of TPN, lessen enteral feeding time, improve weight gain, improve behavioral organization, decrease the use of sedation, decrease neonatal complications like intraventricular hemorrhage, lessen hearing failure, and decrease the length of stay in the NICU. Specifically, skin-to-skin -skin or kangaroo care promotes affection, bonding, attachment, and milk-releasing hormones in the mother. It is so important to encourage skin-to-skin, -skin, but we as healthcare providers must also ensure we do not jeopardize the infant's need for oxygen. Encompassing the above, developmentally supportive care reduces mechanical ventilation time, CPAP treatment, and supplemental oxygen duration. Moving forward, I will ensure that I organize care into clusters to ensure that the infant is able to rest as much as possible. I have learned the benefits of respiratory support and that they're substantial, but they also open doors for vulnerability. For example, CPAP can cause skin breakdown and be loud, which causes overstimulation of the infant. I realize that respiratory support is intimidating for parents too, so it's so important to encourage them to participate in caring for their infant and provide whatever support or education they need to ensure that they can provide the care for their infant. I also now know that proper positioning of the infant not only allows them to be more comfortable until the next time they are disturbed, but it also has positive effects for how they develop neurologically because they fall into a deeper REM sleep state. I mean, they only have one brain, so what we do to them now will affect them for the rest of their lives. So it's so important to consider all the factors of developmentally supportive care and use them. I have learned to be reflective in regards to my own actions and ways of being while providing care in the NICU. I will encourage the parents to be there as often as they can to ensure they are involved in the care provided to their infant. 
Overall, moving forward, I am going to consider all the factors of developmentally supportive care and implementing them in all of my care with any patient that I have, not only respiratory supportive babies. To my nurse in the NICU, how goes your day? This little poem I've sent on its way. For my pal averse, not bad, could be worse, as long as it won't go astray. She's kind-hearted, empathetic, and friendly as can be. And most everyone will agree that her ways are great. They are truly first rate. There's no one more kind-hearted, empathetic, and friendly as she. A message of praise I am sending. Your kindness appears never ending. So thank you once more from my heart, soul, and core for filling a need that was pending.